Hi, and welcome to the Working Differently in Extension podcast. I'm Bob Birch. Great to have you along for today's program. Uh, you might have noticed a theme developing here over the few, last few weeks of a lot of people uh, joining the podcast who presented at the NACDEP CDS conference in Big Sky uh, that I attended. And it was a great opportunity to be exposed to a lot of folks uh, in extension and in community development uh, in general. Uh, that I hadn't before, and so that's why we've we've welcomed Myra Moss today. Myra is an associate professor and extension educator at Ohio State University Extension, and she presented at the NACDEP CDS conference uh, a presentation called Building Collaborative Partnerships Around Critical Community Stakeholder Issues, Watersheds, Agriculture, and the City's Water Source, and we'll talk a little bit about that and about uh, Myra's uh, work in Ohio. So welcome to the podcast, Myra. Thank you very much. So how did you get started in extension? Um, you've, what I read online is you've been extension since 1989 consistently or on and off or how did no, you get started? Yeah, consistently since 89, but I actually had a, a career before coming to extension. I worked as a city county planner in um, the college town of Athens, Ohio for a while and worked for some community action agencies and um, then took a job with extension and economic development because I found that's where my, that's where my passion really was. And you started sort of at a county level? Yes, I did. Actually, I started in two counties in southeastern Ohio, Appalachian, Ohio, um, and these two counties were very distressed, um, very affected by the recession. And a lot of work we did was to try and, you know, traditional economic development activities, try to create jobs and expand the tax base. And we're actually pretty successful at it. And so uh, you work in, the, in community development in Ohio now. Uh, how did you kind of come to your current role? Okay, it was kind of interesting. Um, when I was doing economic development at the local level, I found that even though in communities we created jobs, it didn't seem to impact the community the way we were hoping it would. Um, we were hoping that if you create jobs that you'll wind up having um, more tax money for your schools, you know, for your public services such as parks and recreation, that people would live in the community and, and support the local uh, retailers. So we were hoping there would be kind of this spillover effect from the actual creation of manufacturing jobs. But what we found was that um, people were willing to drive an hour to come to our community to work, but chose to live in other communities because they had services and and excellent schools and um, probably better housing. So we kind of gravitated toward saying, well, and this was happening in the whole discussion of economic development at this time in the nation, we started talking about quality of life issues and how important that was for really realizing um, economic development benefits for a community. So this new um, kind of concept was, was occurring internationally. It wasn't really in the U.S. Um, yet, although it was, was starting to emerge, but mostly in, in large cities on the West Coast, like Portland and um, areas like that. And the concept was sustainable development. And the idea behind what that was that it's not enough just to create jobs. You also need to balance that with what are the social benefits that you're creating for your community, and then also what kind of effect are you having on the environment? So if you create jobs that are going to harm the environment, that's not sustainable over the long run. So we started really looking more toward sustainability as a way to approach economic development in communities. And, and we're lucky enough to find some, you know, find one community that was willing to work with. The community was, um, was called Noble County, and it again was in Appalachian, Ohio. And um, the extension educator there at the time 
had actually come from the West Coast and was a little bit familiar with a sustainable development concept. So they said, okay, let's give this a try in our community and see how it works. So we piloted a two year long um, process where we developed a community vision. Um, and I know your interest is in engaging stakeholders. We went throughout the community, talked to anybody we could, um, in order to find out what the community's shared vision of the future was. Um, this was kind of precipitated because a, um, a large-scale hog operation was locating in the county, and it was causing, as you can imagine, a lot of conflict in the community. Um, and the county commissioners were uh, actually somewhat puzzled because they thought that the creation of jobs as a result would kind of outweigh everything else. But it turned out there were environmentalists who were concerned about it, and this, the uh, conflict actually made the national news. <laughs> so we came in and we said, okay, we're going to try and find out really what your community wants. Where is the, you know, where's the consensus? And um, went throughout, as I said, the entire county and talked to people and came up with a vision um, that we then shared um, with the community and helped them uh, develop goals around that. So it was a very engaged um, process and uh, was very successful. So let's talk about engagement. I think um, in my experience, there might be some different views on that, right, about what engagement really is. Um, so in, in, in your context of, the, of sustainable development in the community, how do, you, how do you define and how do you really measure what true engagement, citizen engagement is? Okay. Um, it's, it's a very time-consuming process. I need to say that at the outset. <laughs> it's not easy to do. It requires a lot of work, but what we usually do in a community is we'll get a cadre of volunteers who do most of the work. Which, works, which is uh, very effective because they're already trusted by the community. It's not these, you know, people coming in from the outside and, and you know, basically suggesting what they need to do. It really comes from the grassroots up. One of the important concepts in this is that um, in, in, an, in a pr planning process, the public officials, the leadership in the community needs to agree, needs to take the position that we want to find out what it is our community wants, and then we're going to help implement that by putting resources toward it. So it's, it kind of flips traditional planning on its head <laughs> um, and goes much further than you know, community meetings where you gather people in and, you know, they give you input. Um, what we did was a process called going to where people gather, okay? And what that means is we actually went figuratively to people's living rooms. Um, and actually sometimes literally to people's <laughs> living rooms. We found out those places in the community where people were likely to gather, in some communities, that even included um, the local um, drinking establishment on, um, you know, dollar beer night or, or roasted chicken night or something like that, where people actually came in and it basically became a gathering place for the entire community. So that was um, one unusual thing we did. Um, we worked very closely with a steering committee that was broadly based and represented all sectors of the community, and they were able to not only facilitate visioning sessions, but also could suggest where they were most effective, you know, where they could happen that you would reach certain audiences. Um, I'll give you one example. In one community, we wanted to reach seniors, so we went to the you know, their, their um, luncheon that they have every day. And the people um, on the steering committee said, that's great, you're going to reach a certain section of, of seniors, but you also need to go to this other place because they're a different socioeconomic class. So it was the wisdom and the knowledge of the steering committee, which was broad-based, 
that helped us build inclusion into this whole process. Um, when we went out, we asked two questions. The first one was, uh, what do you value about your community that you want to preserve for your grandchildren and great-grandchildren? And the second one was, um, what do you hope for the future for your grandchildren and great-grandchildren? And since we talked to people who represented social, environmental, and economic interests, we were able to find out where all three of those groups intersected so that we could find, again, that common vision and that common um, understanding of what was unique and important about their community that they wanted to build on. When we asked about grandchildren and great-grandchildren, it pushed people out two generations. So it's very much a very long-term planning window. Um, so we were able to balance and interconnect social, environmental, and economic issues and features. And we were able to look at long-term planning. Um, and we had a steering committee that was inclusive that broke up into work groups um, around the themes that came out of the vision sessions and then helped develop different chapters of what became the eventual plan. So how does that, um, how does that turn into policy today, right? Because I would imagine if I asked, you know, any particular farmer in North Dakota, I was like, what do you want for your great grandchildren? They'd be like, well, I'd like them to farm this land. Yes. And I said, well, because of climate change, that means you, you know, have to reduce your carbon emissions or whatever you have to get, or whatever the, the solution is, a policy solution in order to make this land arable, uh, you know, 50 years from now, then they might change their tune a little bit or they might have a problem with that. So how, so if you build consensus around something far in the future, you find that consensus point, then how does that really translate to sort of acceptable policy uh, today? Yeah, I think it does. And um, I think because I think once people recognize what they want their future to be, so they want their kids to farm their land, then you work backwards. What kind of steps do you need to take to make that be a reality 50 years from now? Um, it's not just all in the, in the future. You've got to look backwards or start out with a one-year plan, with a three-year plan, with a five-year plan, constantly modify it, analyze it, make sure it's working effectively, change it if it needs to be changed. It's not a static process where a plan's created, put on a shelf, and that's it. It's got to be worked. But in the process of understanding where they want to be 50 years from now, then they can start looking at, well, okay, what impact will, you know, climate change have on that future? We, we try not to, um, it's difficult sometimes, like you said, with a farmer, um, to throw out terms like climate change. Basically, you will lose your audience, okay? Okay. So we're very careful not to be in the position of putting barriers. What we looked at, look at is what are the possibilities and then work backwards from there. Then if you find a barrier, then how are we going to deal with this barrier so that we can reach that future? So that's the approach we take. It's a little bit more um, asset-based and a little bit more positive, even even when we do our visioning sessions, if somebody starts raising some immediate problems, we'll say, no, this is not why we're here. We're talking about what's possible for the future. We all know what our problems are today. Let's start looking at the future, where we want to be, and then work backwards because then that will help us address our problems. So your, your presentation uh, at NACDEP was about building collaborative partnerships around sort of these critical issues. So how, and maybe we're talking about two different uh, processes here, but um, how do those, what kind of partnerships were built and how does that, you know, lead to sort of the collaboration around addressing these issues? 
Well, uh, one of the things in the, in the Columbus Watershed Project um, plan is we were brought in because Extension CD was brought in because we had experience in sustainable planning and they did want to take that uh, approach or at least have that awareness. But what we found was in the whole process, and this, this is part of the engagement too, we actually we were involved in both education and outreach. Um, the city was unaware of the um, concerns and goals of the agricultural community. And the agricultural community was just as unaware about the city's goals and concerns. And when you're in a situation like that, sometimes it can turn into an adversarial relationship. Um, the city of uh, Columbus had two nitrate events where they had to uh, restrict water usage in the last, well, it's last three years now. And um, they pinpointed agriculture and the runoff in the watersheds as the problem. Well, the difficulty is only about 4% of the watershed is within the city's jurisdiction. So you've got 96% that's basically outside of their control. So how do you develop a collaborative relationship where the city comes to understand the issues of the agricultural stakeholders, and then they come to understand the issues of the city. Um, and what we found was that um, there was some misunderstanding about agriculture as a business, okay? It's not a lifestyle, it is, it actually is, well, might be for some people, but for many people it's a business, okay? So um, if nitrates are a problem and you're putting nitrates on your field and they're expensive to use, the last thing in the world a farmer wants is for them to run off in the watershed because they're losing, basically losing money. And they also care about the waterways, okay? So it's a financial and an environmental issue for them. The city had a very similar kind of problem in that they had to install a $34 million um, investment in an ion uh, system which could remove nitrates and then was also additionally expensive to operate. So they had an economic issue um, because of the nitrates that were being, you know, that were running off in the fields. So there was, we brought together kind of a common understanding, but it needs to go much further toward an actual network where people can um, be in the same space, talk to each other face to face, where the farmers can actually tour the city's water treatment plants and the city can actually tour the farmlands. So, um, and it hasn't quite reached that stage yet. What has happened is that a grant was received um, by one of our one of the people involved in from extension it's a US EPA grant and it's going to f fall or it's going to use um, the watershed north of Ohio as a pilot to come up with best practices for farmer engagement and also city engagement so the next step still needs to be taken and extension will be involved in that next step trying to broker those relationships and broker that understanding. What things do you think are key to brokering that understanding? And, and are, are those lessons coming from, you know, where are they coming from? Are they coming from your community work, your stakeholder engagement work in, uh, in sustainable development? Um, how do we get to common ground, I guess? Yeah, well, <laughs> Yes, it is coming from our community de development work. And I think there's a few phases that need to happen here because you really can't expect miracles overnight. <laughs> so the first phase I think would be um, for the farming community and the city to understand each other's goals and concerns and issues that they're dealing with related, you know, that may be related to each other. So a lot of that is going to require, as I said, um, actual tours, educational sessions with key people. I'm, I see Extension um, Agriculture taking a really critical role in this. Um, 
understanding key issues that affect both parties. Now, we already did stakeholder interviews and came up with goals and priorities for the agricultural community, which we then shared with the city. So what we're trying to do is raise the level of awareness. Um, once that is raised, our thought was um, to create an kind of almost an informal network where people can get together, where you can get the city principals together with the agricultural stakeholders, and they can talk about what they're engaged in and find areas where they're either doing very similar things and they can collaborate together, or areas that they want to move into that they might help each other. The city does have a, a track record of incentivizing. There's a program called EQIP, and in one of their watersheds, they actually helped incentivize farmers to participate in the EQIP program. So there is a history of the city um, actually putting some resources toward, um, toward improvements for farmers. So those are the kinds of things they need to identify. Where, if the city's got limited funds, where is the best place they can put them? What can the city do to help the farmers um, implement the best management practices that will achieve the best results. So those are the kinds of steps that need to be taken. Are there regulatory bodies that are part of this mix as well? Well, Ohio um, Department of Ag is a critical one. Um, uh, soil and water conservation districts were involved with this as well as um, NRCS. So the answer to that is yes, there are regulatory and funding agencies involved in this. Yeah. So what do you think the level of trust is between um, ag and those regulatory issues? I mean, it, it seems to be a point of contention in various places across the country of sort of distrust of whether it's EPA or, or state pollution control or something like that. Um, and, yeah, so maybe I'll just ask you, what it, where, where do you think that's at in, in with the people you're working with in Ohio? Well, I think we still need to build that trust. Um, I, a number of years ago in Toledo, and this, this kind of set the stage, actually Columbus wanted to kind of get ahead of, of anything like this happening. In Toledo, there were harmful algal blooms in um, the western basin of Lake Erie, which is uh, Toledo's source water for drinking water. They literally had to shut down their plants for weeks, which affected 400,000 people. So they were without water for weeks. As a result, the state legislature passed some legislation regarding nutrient management standards for farmers and also put some money toward the program. Um, it does specifically relate to Northwest Ohio, but other cities in Ohio can see you know, what is the potential for this happening in our city, in our area? Um, so Columbus, Columbus's issue is they, they want to get out ahead of this so that it doesn't have to turn into uh, lawsuits or regulations. They want to do it collaboratively. Um, the farmers would prefer not to have those regulations imposed. So there's an incentive for them to begin to collaborate. So this, the incentives are there. Um, what needs to happen is, I mean, how do you build trust between parties? You build trust by um, seeing actions, you know, reciprocity, um, following through on your commitments, um, understanding each other. So those are the kinds of things that really need to happen. But the stage, I think, is set for, for that happening. Why extension in this process, I guess? What, what, is there something and what things specifically about cooperative extension, uh, you know, what advantages do we have in terms of brokering this that maybe other organizations might not? Okay, uh, that's, that's interesting because, uh, yeah, and, and I'm even looking at community development as being a good brokering agent. Um, the contract that this engineer, we're a subcontractor to the engineer, and the contract they enter, uh, entered into had something like seven subcontractors. 
they did a request for a proposal. We were approached because of our sustainable development background and outreach and education, and mostly because our connection with the agricultural community, okay? So, um, as I said, seven contractors, we were the only one that was not a for-profit contractor. So we're kind of an outlier in a sense. Um, and I think what made us unique is that our expertise was not only uh, one team member was our director of watershed management for extension and for the college of um, or excuse me, the School of Natural Resources and Environment for OSU. So, um, but we also had that facilitation and that um, expertise in building collaborative relationships. Um, the engineers took care of the technical parts of it, okay? But it was the understanding the community, brokering those relationships, um, that I'm not sure the city or the engineer could have as effectively done on their own because they didn't have the, um, the contacts, the connections, um, probably the level of trust, and um, also were not as, uh, you know, expert in facilitation and collaboration. So, yes, I think Extension was a unique partner and I think that's what we really brought to the table. Well, it sounds like incredible work, Myra. Uh, thank you for, for doing it. Thank you for sharing it. And uh, thanks for appearing on the podcast. You're quite welcome. And thank you. Myra Moss is an associate professor and extension educator with the Ohio State University <laughs> Extension. Uh, we've been talking about her presentation, Building Collaborative Partnerships Around Critical Community Stakeholder Issues, Watersheds, Agriculture, and the City's Water Source. Thank you for joining us for the podcast. This is Working Differently in Extension, and you can find us on Twitter at WDNEXT, on SoundCloud anytime at soundcloud.com slash working differently. Show notes for this episode and all episodes available at bobbirch.com. Our theme music is Noon's Acid by And Nobody Cared. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day.